diagram just shows us the we have just been emphasizing that just keep in mind non muscle invasive and muscle invasive and we said t2 is when the the muscle the, the muscles are involved and uh, and so we consider muscle non muscle invasive bladder cancer to be uh, those tumors that are only limited to the sub epithelial tissues that means uh, uh, T, 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 TIS, TA, and T1 are, are non muscle invasive. And from T2, then you start to call these cancers muscle invasive. So, how do these patients present? Uh, transitional cell carcinoma has a different presentation uh, from squamous cell carcinoma. In transitional cell carcinoma, you have painless hematuria, okay? And the hematuria may be alarming and heavy. Uh, and how do you know this? We discussed it when we were discussing the symptomatology uh, in urology. And we said for you to think that uh, hematuria is very significant, the patient will usually have um, uh, reported clots. You will have, you report hematuria, but you will also report that uh, they are clots when he's passing urine. Uh, and for transitional cell carcinoma, there's no correlation between the hematuria uh, and uh, the bladder cancer. In other words, the patient uh, may have uh, a very small tumor, but which bleeds very significantly to cause alarming hematuria. Uh, for squamous cell carcinoma, the symptoms are usually those that arise from chronic cystitis and bladder irritation. In other words, these are patients who will have nocturia, they may have urgency and frequency, and of course, uh, lower abdominal discomfort. In the other clinical presentations, uh, suprapubic mass, and by the time you feel a suprapubic mass, this tumor is probably uh, advanced. And then, of course, there are things we call shreds. They are sort of like uh, necrotic tissues passed in urine. And uh, these ones also are a symptom of bladder cancer. The patient may also have foul smelling turbid urine, may have lower limbidema because we already said that uh, the lymph nodes involved could be uh, the external uh, iliac lymph nodes. And we know these ones drain the lower limbs. So if they're involved, then you may have lower limb edema. Then you, you may have uh, hematuria, uh, which may be minimal, not like the, the gross one. And then, of course, uh, we said most of the tumors are the trigon. And we know that the trigon is near the bladder neck. So the, the tumor may cause obstruction, uh, blood outlet obstruction, and therefore leading to uh, urine retention. Then uh, we may also have uh, hydroureteronephrosis because the trigon, that means uh, it is very easy to find um, the ureteric orifices involved. And so uh, you may have obstruction of, um, of, of the, these orifices, uh, which will lead you to have hydronephrosis. Renal failure. Now, how do we diagnose bladder cancer? Of course, we diagnose uh, from the history, and we've said the most important is painless hematuria for transitional cell carcinoma. And uh, of course, the irritative uh, symptoms um, in, uh, in the squamous cell. So we may have to do urine microscopy. And uh, in these ones, you want to, to look for uh, red blood cells. Uh, you can look for ova in, in case there is schistosomiasis history, and of course the white blood cell count. The most common is, uh, the, the most important is red blood cells. You want to confirm because we've said much as there is usually uh, gross hematuria, uh, which is total in nature, you may also have patients uh, with microscopic um, hematuria. Uh, of course, people will say, if you already know the blood, the, the urine is red, 
why then would you want to confirm the red blood cells? But we know that uh, there are other things that can make the urine uh, red. So it is always important to do the urinalysis and you confirm red blood cells. Uh, and then you can also do urine cytology, get some urine, send it to the pathologist, and they look for the cancer cells in the urine. Renal function tests are important because we already said that uh, because these bladder cancers can cause obstruction, they can lead to renal failure. Ultrasonography is usually the initial imaging investigation, and it will show you the bladder tumor in the bladder, but it will also show you hydroureteral nephrosis if the tumor is causing um, obstruction of the upper urinary tract. Uh, abdominal CT scan is very important in telling you how deep the tumor is, local invasion, and of course, lymph node involvement. The most important investigation is cystoscopy. Uh, you take a biopsy, and of course, you also do the biomanual examination uh, under general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia. And this is important because um, the, biomanual pulp, the biomanual palpation or examination gives you an idea whether the tumor is already uh, perivesico or if the tumor uh, is not. And it is important in deciding uh, which surgery you may have to give you the histology results. Now, these histology results should tell you the type of the cancer and should also tell you uh, whether this cancer is involving muscle or not. In other words, it should differentiate whether the tumor is muscle invasive or non muscle invasive. Uh, this is just a picture showing you ultrasound scan. Uh, let me just pick the pointer. Uh, it's just demonstrating hydronephrosis in this picture. You can see that the callus is um, dilated, and then it is showing you a stone uh there and then of course this is a scan uh showing you a bladder tumor this is urine this dark thing and you can see an irregular mass all the way okay so this is the bladder tumor and the the, the ultrasound usually will give you an estimate of the size and uh, the location of where the tumor is now how do we treat this uh, bladder cancer uh, all modalities of cancer treatment can be used either single or in combination. And uh, the treatment depends on the cancer type uh, that you have. Surgery is the best treatment. And the first one is endoscopic surgery. We discussed about uh, endoscopic prostatectomy. So in this, in this one, it is not very different. It's only that now the cutting is in the blood and not on the prostate. So you can do endoscopic resection or what we call endo, endo, endoscopic control. And this is uh, done only for transitional cell carcinoma. And uh, you, this should only be considered for tumors that are non-muscle invasive. In other words, muscle, uh, TA and uh, T1. And uh, this is only for these kind of tumors. For muscle invasive, we shall, we shall see later, but when the tumor has already invaded, invaded the muscles, this endoscopic resection cannot cure the patient. So it has no role in this, in this scenario. So transurethral resect, uh, resection, and uh, of course, after resecting the bladder cancer uh, endoscopically, the patient should have a cystoscopy uh, every three months for the first year. And then uh, after that, if you have not seen any tumor, then you do you continue doing cystoscopy six monthly uh, for the next two years. And then after that, if you have not seen a tumor, you start doing um, uh, cystoscopy once a year for the next five years. And if you have not seen a tumor, you may want to stop the cystoscopies. At any time when you find a tumor, you start again. So, uh, endoscopic resection is only for tumors that are non muscle invasive, TA and T1.
The other modality is uh, intravesical chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Uh, if high, if there's a high grade tumor, or if you resect these tumors and they recur. What I forgot to emphasize is that these bladder cancers actually recur. So that's why we need to do to keep doing the cystoscopy so that you find the tumor early and you and, and you you resect it early. Um, recurrence. And so when these patients, when you get patients who have good recurrence, then you should, uh, in addition to resection of the tumor endoscopically, then you should also add um, uh, either chemotherapy or immunotherapy, intravesical. In other words, you are putting this drug in the blood. And um, in, the, in the chemotherapy, we usually use mitomycin C. And in the immunotherapy, we use BCG. BCG is a live attenuated vaccine. And therefore, after cutting, you cannot instill it immediately. Uh, otherwise, you get sepsis, severe sepsis. So usually you give the BCG two weeks after the resection. And uh, for mitomycin C, which is chemotherapy, this one should be given immediately. And that's the difference. The other modality you can do is segmental resection. And uh, this is more common in uh, adenocarcinomas. We say the adenocarcinoma is more common uh, in a persistent uracus. And so this tumor can be resected very safely because the, it will be very far from the trigon. Segmental resection is not possible if the tumor is, uh, is at the trigon or near the trigon. Uh, the other modality is radical cystectomy and urine diversion. And uh, this modality is the treatment for muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. Uh, now, these things we are discussing mostly, uh, especially for the endoscopic control, is for transitional cell carcinoma. For squamous cell, we shall see in this same slide at the end that these tumors actually uh, will just benefit from uh, radical cystectomy and urine diversion. So, all muscle invasive uh, transitional cell carcinomas should be treated with radical cystectomy and urine diversion, okay? And then the superficial, it is only when you have failed uh, in the conservative. You have failed, uh, you do endoscopic, but it fails. Uh, you have recurrence that uh, has failed to subside irrespective of, uh, despite of uh, even adding intravesical chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And uh, then finally, of course, all schistosomiasis related tumors uh, should be treated with um, uh, radical cystectomy and urine diversion. Radical cystectomy means you remove uh, the bladder, the prostate, the seminal vesicles. And then, of course, if you remove the bladder, you must divert the urine. And uh, the common one now is uh, the men's two porch. You divert the urine to the sigmoid, you create a sigmoid porch, and you divert the urine there meaning that the patient is going to be passing both stool and urine uh, through the, the, the rectum. Uh, patients with cancer in situ, we already said this, these cancers are usually high grade and the prognosis is poor. And these ones can be treated with uh, intravesical chemotherapy or immunotherapy. BCG uh, has proven to be superior uh, to mitomycin. Uh, radiotherapy has a role and uh, this one is for patients who are unfit for surgery. Yeah, they are very sick, they are delayed. Uh, you can use this uh, radiotherapy in such patients. You can also use the radiotherapy as adjuvant treatment. And of course, you can use it to treat and bleeding. Uh, chemotherapy can also be used, but it has poor uh, response, like we already said, uh, uh, and it can either be used uh, as new adjuvant or adjuvant. And the, the combination used is MVA, that is methotrexate, vimplastin, actinomycin D, and cisplastin. And these ones can also be used. Uh, the prognosis, blood cancers that are superficial and uh, are grade one, in other words, uh, when we say superficial, we are talking of 
non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These cancers can actually have very good prognosis, uh, but of course we said that the recurrence rates are high and therefore you should do follow up using cystoscopy. Um, and of course you can also do urine cytology and follow up and they can always tell you if there are blood, uh, if there are cancer cells in the urine. You can also use an abdominal scan, uh, chest x-rays, um, and of course you must also follow up on the urine diversion problems. We know that if you divert the urine to the colon, uh, the colon is not like the bladder, there's absorption of some electrolytes that will still continue. And so you should keep looking out for uh, these electrolyte uh, problems in the patients whom you've done urine diversion, uh, but also they may have um, bladder cancer as also being predisposed um, from the, the diversion. So you should always uh, follow up to, to, end, to identify any issues of bladder, uh, of urine diversion. Uh, and I think with that, we've come to the end of uh, the first presentation about the bladder cancers. Uh, I will welcome three questions. And after that, I, I will be very happy to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Gotharido. Uh, let me see. I will be very happy to introduce to you uh, Dr. Gotharido. Um, to take us through the penile cancers. Uh, I don't know whether our group leader is around. Uh, you could coordinate. Um, you you could coordinate the, the question session. I'll only take three questions. Yes, and thank you. Yes, we have two hands. Yes. We have two hands and the one question in group. So I'll ask Chin to unmute and ask his question. It was the first to put up the hand. Yes, uh, thank you. Everybody. I just want to ask Dr. Marvin why it's important that we do segmentary section as far away from the trigon as possible. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, of course, we know that uh, um, the trigon has many structures, as bladder neck, and uh, the resection there may actually cause injury uh, to, to the ureteric orifice. And that's why it is very good that you only consider segmental resection away from the bladder, uh, from the bladder neck, from the trigon. So if the tumor say is in the dome, if it is in the dome, it is very easy to do segmental resection. Uh, but this surgery should not be done in the trigon because you will injure the ureteric orifices. You may even um, ligate them. And of course, uh, if you do that, then you can attract. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, doctor. We have one question in the chat, which says, does a urine diversion lead to an incontinence? Secondary, doesn't it predispose the patient to pyelonephritis? That is from Addison. Yeah, uh, Addison, thank you very much for your question. Um, so the, there is no way the, the urine diversion causes uh, incontinence because when you do that diversion, you are counting on the anus sphincter. And we know that the anus sphincter is, uh, is very good. Uh, it, it is able to, to control gas, liquid, and, uh, and solid. So when you do urine diversion, there is no, it doesn't cause incontinence. You actually utilize the anus sphincter uh, to achieve what we call uh, continent urine diversion. There are, other mod there are other surgeries for urine diversion that are an incontinent but this one is continent uh, and the patient is trained on how often to open the bowels and they don't have any problems with, uh, with incontinence. Probably what is important is that before you do urine diversion, 
uh, this kind of urine diversion, you should be certain that the anus sphincter uh, functions normally. Uh, and if it is, act, is if it's functioning normally, you won't have uh, issues with incontinence. Uh, he asked another important question that uh, doesn't this uh, predispose, doesn't this kind of urine diversion predispose to infection? Uh, and uh, the answer is, uh, while you do the surgery, uh, there are techniques that you use to prevent um, uh, reflux, okay? Uh, vesicoureteral reflux. And we call those uh, anti-reflux techniques. And if you use them and you don't get reflux, in other words, urine does not flow from the porch backwards to the kidneys, then you don't get the infection. But if you don't use the anti-reflux mechanisms uh, or techniques, then you get a recurrent infection. So it's advisable that when you operate these patients, you actually take time and do an anti-reflux um, anastomosis of the ureter onto the, the sigmoid. So we shall have one, one last question, and then I will introduce Dr. Guthal to take us through uh, cancers of the penis. The last one was from Tony Chakamide. I raised up his hand, but he put his question in the chat. The ruckus, before it causes issues after all, the... that is his question. Yeah, that's a very good question. <clears throat> and we know that those congenital anomalies are usually sorted early. But in some patients, they are not. So when they remain there, those are patients who get uh, predisposed to adenocarcinoma of the urinary bladder. Now, with that, I would like to thank you uh, um, for your questions and for being very attentive. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Gothari Do, uh, who is uh, our SHO. He's almost done with the course and uh, he has rotated in urology and uh, he is going to take us through uh, penile cancer. Dr. Gosaldo, I welcome you and I request that you share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor, for introducing me. Yeah, I'm ready to take you through the penile carcinomas. Dr. Gothaldo, you can share your, your screen and we start. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you are listening to me. Yeah, I'm going to take you through the cancers of the penis. But before we talk about the cancers of the penis, we need to first talk about the pre-malignant lesions, lesions that uh, occur earlier before can penile cancers develop. And this is the flow of what we are going to So Dr. Gothaldo, put it in PowerPoint. Eh? Okay. Yeah.
So we shall first look at look at the introduction, and then in the introduction we shall look at the anatomy and then lymphatic drainage. We all know the anatomy of the penis. I put the diagrams to remind us of the important structures of the penis. The penis has the, the glands, the shaft, and then the, the corpora, where it is, is attached to the, to the bones of the pelvis. Then cross-sectionally, we are able to see it has the, the outside, outer side, it has the skin, then it has the superficial fascia, deep fascia, deep fascia, Okay, we are looking at the skin, superficial fascia, deep fascia, and then between the deep fascia, there is a tunica epigenia that surrounds the corpora bodies. And one where we have deep artery of the penis, and then those other of the penis and the nerves, plus the venous before we go into the cancer of the penis. The lymphatic drain, the lymphatic is from the pedius. These ones, they connect with the lymphatics from the foreskin and they play to the superficial the vinyl nodes. And then the lymphatics from the glands, they combine with the lymphatics from the corporal bodies and they drain, drain into the deep pelvic nodes. Yes, we can hear you. So just just make. Uh, okay. Sorry for the. Uh, make it a PowerPoint. For, Go to PowerPoint and yeah, then you proceed. Yeah. You went off. You, you, I, I think you went off when you were starting the pre malignant lesions. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry for that. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, I was still discussing about the malignant lesions, and one of them was the carcinoma in situ. And then, as I had, as I had said, it normally has two presentations. One of them is erythroplasia, penis, and the prepuce. And then we have also the Bowen's disease that involve the penile shaft and the renal region. Both of these tumors are characterized by non-invasive changes of the carcinoma. So I showed you the uh, diagram. Let me include my point again. So this is an, a diagram of uh, that is showing the penile papillomatosis. This patient presented in OPD with the extensive uh, extensive warts to his prepuce and then the part of the of the circus of his gland. You can see it's very extensive. So that, as I as as I had said, you shouldn't confuse it with the penile cancer. That's why you. Before you do any penile amputation, you need first do biopsy and confirm, as we shall look in the coming slides. So then Bowen's disease, as I, as I had said, it is characterized by sharp redefined plaques of scary erysema on the penile shaft. And this is either it can be crusted, crusted means that they are like blacking. Eh? Or are serrated, and the appearance may be confused with the bovinoid papyrus, papyrosis. And 5% of these patients 
they tend to develop an invasive disease if the disease is not treated. And uh, you need a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. So there are other lesions or pre premalignant lesions that are associated with the development of benign cancer. One of them is the chitinous one. I didn't include it here, but uh, uh, it's, it's image. But uh, when you search about it, you will be able to see it. Then we also have uh, baronitis derotica obliterans. Then uh, another thing is keratotic baronitis, condyromata achumunita, like I uh, uh, showed you, that uh, picture I showed you, condyromata and then Bowenoid papyrosis, which can be confused with Bowenoid disease. So now let's look at the invasive cancer. Here we have a, a, a picture that is showing this. What you're seeing here is the penis, and it is characterized by hyperkeratotic skin, as you've seen. And then uh, inside the prepuce, which is, cannot be refracted by now because of the invasive nature of the disease, that's when you would be able to say that there's a malignancy. Here, the second picture, the penis had undergone autoamputation and the inguinal lymph nodes had been infiltrated and there is extensive uh, sepsis that's going on as one of the complications of these penile malignancies. So the invasive cancer, it only accounts for 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 of oral malignant neoplasms. Worldwide, the, its incidence is declining, and the disease of old men is an abrupt increase in incidence in the 60th, 60th decade of life. Studies done in America, they have they found out that there are no racial differences between whites and blacks. So both blacks and, and whites are affected in the same manner. So the risks. Who is at risk of developing this penile cancer? Patients who, uh, who have not had circumcision, especially in early childhood. The studies have shown that if you did a circumcision in late adulthood, it doesn't protect you from, from getting this disease. It's only when you have had neonatal or early childhood circumcision that you are prevented from this disease. People with poor hygiene who don't clean their penile, they don't. And then people whose foreskin cannot be retracted like in phimosis. And then people, males with multiple sexual patterns. In multiple sexual patterns, you are likely to contract these human papilloma viruses, which are like the culprit of causing these diseases. Then human papilloma virus infection, smoking, and then penile lichen sclerosis. Another risk factor. Hello, can we mute? Another risk factor is the HIV. It has been observed that patients with HIV tend to have uh, a higher prevalence of uh, this penile carcinoma. Although some old diseases have not yet captured it, but the current literature includes it as one of the risk factors, especially when circumcised, has poor hygiene, and at the same time has HIV. Are we still together? So, how do you prevent? Hello? Yes, okay. we are with you. We are with you, Dr. Gothaldo. Just go on. Okay. Then prevention. Prevention. How do we prevent this cancer? One of the preventative measures is to do RNA or neto circumcision, which has been shown to prevent this disease. And then the other thing is behavioral changes. And in behavioral changes, we need to stop smoking. You reduce on the number of sexual patterns that you have had in your life if you have not had them. Then uh, you also practice good hygiene, especially to the, those pe 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 people who are not circumcised. You need to clean your prepis very well and you remove the smegma, that white stuff that is between the prepis and the glands. You need to always clean it off and then dry your penis very well. 
So let's look at the natural history of the disease. It begins with a small lesion that gradually extends to involve the entire glands. And this lesion can start at the prepuce or the corona of, your, of, the, of, the, of the penis and then spreads from there. And its appearance may be looking like papillary, like the, the first picture I showed you, or it can be exot exophytic, or it can be flat, or you can have an ulcer that may be confused with like simple infections like um, herpes viruses. Eh? And it has been shown that flat and ulcerative lesions have tendency towards other nodal mates, and it is associated with a poor five-year survival. The rate of growth of papillary and ulcerative lesions are similar. Lesions which are more than five centimeters and those extending over 75% of the shaft are associated with increased incidences of meds and decreased survival rate. If these patients are left untreated, then they are going to have penile amputation like the other picture I showed you when a patient who had extensive groin lymphadenal passive infection, a lymph, lymph node sepsis, and then penile auto amputation. And B, there is something to note, especially with the anatomy of the penis. The back's fascia acts as a temporary natural barrier to local extension of the tumor. And this back's fascia is the one that protects the corporate bodies from other invasion by this tumor. And then if a tumor has penetrated the back fascia and the tunica begenia, then there is invasion of the vascular corpora and establishes potential for vascular dissemination. Bladder and urethral involvement are rare, but they still occur. And the, the earliest route of dissemination is the regional lymph nodes, especially the femoral and the iliac nodes. Metastatic enlargement of the regional nodes leads to skin necrosis, chronic infection, death from sepsis or hemorrhage second at the erosion into the femoral vessels. And the death occurs in the majority of untreated patients within two years. So this is the, from the first picture I showed you, the second, I think the third picture, which was showing extensive necrosis of the skin over the inguinal region. That is what here you are trying to, to explain. So how does it present? We have the sinus. It can present with a, a small penile lesion, or it can be an induration of papule or water growth. And an answer with the elevated or rolled edges can also be seen in these patients. Especially patients with phimosis, where it's very hard to retract their prepuce, the lesion may be hidden inside, and it can only be visible after it had progressed and has caused the erosion through the prepuce, where we shall, the, the patient may present with the false smearing discharge with or without bleeding. So the initial sites of origin, where it starts from the glands, it takes 48%, the prepuce 21%. Sometimes can occur both at the glands and the prepuce in 9%, the corona sarcus in 6%, and the shaft of the penis in the 2%. The symptoms, most of these patients present with a lesion that is less painful compared to the local destructive necrosis. He comes with very big wound, but they will not be complaining of pain. And then I think that's the reason why most of these patients present late, as we shall see. And then can also present with weakness, weight loss, fatigue, and then systemic malaise if the infection or the disease has spread into stage four. Diagnosis, how do you diagnose this disease, you need to take history, examine the patient, and then perform a biopsy. In history, literature has showed that most patients with penile cancer always attain 
seek health medical attention late. And the reason they are given is because they, they feel embarrassed to have such a disease. They have guilt, fear, sometimes it's ignorance. And in most cases, like in Africa, it's common in people with personal neglect. So examination, what do you do in examination? At presentation, we have seen most lesions are confined to the penis. And when you're assessing this lesion, you need to assess its size, where it's located, whether it is fixed to the underlying tissues. If it is on the skin, you need to know whether it is fixed to the, to the corporal bodies. And then, or involvement of the corporal bodies. Then you also need to inspect the base of the penis and the scrotum to rule out extension into these areas. Then the rectal and bimanual examination provides information about the perineal body status and then presence of pelvic meds. And then inguinal areas should be palpated for adenopathy. As you have seen, the earliest site of med is the inguinal lymph nodes. So you need to palpate these lymph nodes and then you rule out the inguinal dissemination. But it may, it may be very hard in Africa where most of the people, especially those ones who have been working then barefooted, most of them have, have already these inguinal lymph nodes. So presence of an enlarged lymph node it does not tell that these patients are have already have met the inguinal region. Most of them can be inflammatory, as we shall see. So biopsy, you need to perform, in most cases we do a wedge biopsy, and it helps in the confirmation of the cancer. Then it also tells the depth of, of invasion, and then presence of vascular invasion, and histological grade of the lesion. Historical examination is mandatory before the initiation of any therapy. So we don't expect someone to do penile amputation before performing a histology examination because there are so many benign conditions that may present as a penile carcinoma, which can be treated with non-invasive techniques. So by you performing a, a penile amputation, you would have denied this patient a chance to own his penis, to possess his penis. And biopsy is always a separate procedure from the definitive surgical treatment. So don't do biopsy at the same time, do what? Do penile amputation or you need first know the status of the biopsy tissue you have taken before you've planned the surgical definitive treatment. So the historical features on biopsy, most cancers of the penis are squamous cell carcinomas. And these ones are characterized by keratinization, epithelial part formation, and various degrees of mitotic activity. So the growth patterns of this cancer, the squamous cell, it can be superficial splitting. It can just only go through the skin and spread without invading the corporal bodies. Or it can be a vertical growth. It goes through the skin into the corporal bodies without going along the penile shaft. Or it can also take the verrucous carcinoma type or malcentric type, where it can, it's like, it has like gaps in between, it can be on the grounds, the shaft, and others. Then historical subtypes of the squamous cell carcinoma, we have the ESO type, which takes about 59%, papillary type, 15%, basaloid type, 10%, verrucous type, 3%. And then the basaloid and sarcomatoid types have aggressive behavior. So they tend to spread area compared to the other types. Then the basaloid type is associated with HPV infection in almost more than 80% of the cases. 
So this squamous cell carcinoma is graded based, based on level of differentiation and then nuclear pneumopism and the number of mitosis. And it is graded into a high grade or a low, a low, a low, a low grade lesion. Staging, how do we stage it? We use TNM, TNM classification. And then there is another staging, which is, which is student friendly, uh, which stages the penile cancer into stage one, two, three, and four. Stage one is confined to the glands and the foreskin. Then stage two, you, when a tumor has invaded the penile shaft, stage three, when it has invaded the regional lymph nodes, and stage four, when you have distant nets to the pelvic regions. Differentials, when you have a, a patient presenting with a penile ulcer, what are other causes? Penile condyromata accumulator. I showed you one of the drawing or one of the pictures, the first picture I showed you. Then you can also have baronitis, the rotica or brittleness. It can be infections like chancre, chancroid, herpes. It can also be tuberculosis. And then syphilitic chancre, where we have lympho, lymphogranulum venereum. So there are so many other diseases that present like penile cancer. That's the reason why you shouldn't do penile amputation before you perform a biopsy on these patients. So management. Management, you need to first stage it. And the staging, you use a, a, a examination and then investigative modalities. And then ultrasound is used to, to tell the nature of the lymph nodes, but it doesn't tell whether they, it can show you lymphadenopathy in the pelvis, but it doesn't tell you that these lymph nodes are, uh, have current metastasis. So the only way to confirm that the disease has reached the, the lymph nodes is for you to do lymphadenectomy and then you perform histology on the, on the lymph nodes. But just basing on lymph node enlargement, per se, alone may not tell you that the cancer has reached the, the, those lymph nodes. And then surgical management, you can also what we do two forms of surgery. One of them is organ preservation surgery. And then another one, you can also do radical penectomy. In organ preservation surgery, it is for other stages of the disease especially patients who come with either carcinoma in situ or stage one, where disease is still limited to the prepuce. So in that case, circumcision and limited excision strategies can help the patient. And in this case, it, it spares the penile shaft and maintains the function and the penile length. Then there is Mohs micro, micrographic surgery. It is also for penile carcinoma in situ, and then small superficial invasive tumor. Then laser ablation has also been used, but studies have shown that it has a high rate of local regional recurrence. So I think it's being discouraged. Then in the the standard mode of treatment is the penile amputation. And then this one is recommended for people with deep invasive or high grade cancers. And in this case, you can do partial orthotopenectomy with perineal urethrostomy, depending on the stage of the disease. If the disease is still located, localized to the penis, to the glands, and it has not yet invaded the corporal bodies, and the lymph nodes, it has, it has not spread even to the lymph nodes there, you may do partial penectomy. Total penectomy is when the tumor has reached, especially stage three and stage four. Stage four mainly is, due to, is for taking down the, the sepsis that may occur with lymph node expiration and the, and the 
control of infection. But otherwise, in stage four, when the disease has already spread to the deep pelvic lymph nodes, surgery may not help much. Then treatment of uh, inguinal nodes. How do you treat the inguinal nodes? They are saying presence and extent of meds, the inguinal nodes are the most important prognostic factor for survival of these patients. And the, the above findings affect the prognosis of the disease more than the tumor grade, gross appearance, and morphological pattern of the primary tumor. And the, 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 good uh, the, the beauty of this tumor it shows prolonged local regional phase before distant meds happen. And then this is a rationale for therapeutic lymphadenectomy. And studies have shown that lymphadenectomy alone can be curative and it should be performed, though it has it is associated with the high mobility, especially in patients with clinical negative groin nodes. So if you have a patient before you, you do you do lymphadenectomy, you need first and uh, understand the nature of the of the local lymph nodes. So not every patient is going to have, with penile cancer is going to have a lymphadenectomy done because studies have shown that this, when you do the infadenectomy, then these patients are going to have a worse life because they're going to have edema of the lower limbs. They have uh, a lot of comorbidities with this. So lymph node enlargement is mainly due to inflammation in most patients. So to do the infadenectomy, you need first treat these patients for at least three months and you see, if the, the, the lymph node enlargement persists, if it subsides, then there is no need for you to do what? Lymph node dissection. And it should only be done in patients with positive nodes. Don't do it in patients with negative nodes. I think that is what I had for you. Thank you. So we shall have uh, three questions because we need to run to the clinic. The group leader can coordinate uh, can coordinate the questions. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Gosparido. Yeah. Thank you. And um. So we have um, uh, three questions from yes, the chat. Please. The first one is from Naigaga. She's asking what's the difference between, between total penectomy and penile amputation? I don't know if I should ask all the questions, you note them down, then you yes. answer all of them at once. Yes, total penectomy and penile amputation. Yes. Oh, they tried to answer her from mm -hmm. members in the group. Okay. I, that's the only Toto in, uh, uh, as I was telling you, Toto in Toto Penectum, eh? Yes, we here in this case, yes. you're going to take off the penis together with the, with the, with the, it's, it's the test cause. Yes. And then uh, you create a, a perineal urethrostomy where the patient is going to be urinating from. Then in the penile amputation, it can be partial or total. So total penectomy is part of the penile amputation. Are you getting me? And in partial, you can and yes. in partial, total in partial penectomy or partial penile amputation, you can take only the glands and part of the shaft, leaving the, the remainder of the shaft. Eh? Yes, okay. doctor. Okay, we have a hand from Edison. Please unmute and ask your question. Uh, thank you much, uh, Dr. Gutharido, for the presentation. Penile yes, cancer. We have seen that uh, 
H I mean HPV. HPV is one of the risk factors. So in uh, in women who present with the yeah HPV. Mm -hmm. So in women who present with the cervical cancer, is it mandatory to call upon their partners for further evaluation concerning penile cancer? Okay. So he's asking about the patients, the women who present with penile with cervical cancer having their partners. I think at this stage, yeah, I, I would advise them to go for screening. But if there is no lesion on their penile shaft or penile prepuce, I think there is no much. We shouldn't stress these men. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will call upon Dr. Marvin to give me a hand on that. But uh, uh, mm, so I, I think. I think you've answered the question rightly. The, the screening should only be in men with suspicious lesions. If you find a woman with a CA cervix and the husband is fine, there's no need. Okay, thank you for clarification. Thank you, Dr. Marvin. Uh, we are done. There are no more questions. There are more questions in the chat. Oh, there's Alfred's question. Yes, there's one question I've been told. That why is penile cancer painless? Yes, the glands penis is one of the most sensitive parts of the body. That's just the, the natural history of the disease, eh? Um, so there is uh, there is really no particular reason. It's just the presentation of the disease. Um, as you may well be aware, most of the cancers are not. Complication, like if someone has lymphadenopathy, sepsis, they may have pain, but the natural history is, is that. So, uh, I would like to thank you for the presentation, Dr. Gotharido. And I see our attendance is at 50. I, my assumption is the, the candidates must be more. And I would like to encourage uh, others to also uh, make, uh, make it a uh, a point to attend these lectures. Doctor. We don't have uh, mortality issues. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't know whether you guys have reported updating in urology this week. I, I will, I'll need an update from Paddy. Yes, doctor. If they sent uh, letters to head of departments and uh, we remember there are five groups and there are five groups. So we shall have a group of 18 or 19 rotating next week. Yeah, different, different groups. So each group will have like one week on neurology. So the rotation start next week, not this week. No, okay. next week on Monday. So Monday we shall have theater and those who are involved should be in attendance. They should also participate in preparing the patients. We have a new urology ward, and you will find it uh, uh, it's with the physiotherapy. We shall rotating there. I expected to clerk the patients in groups, and uh, every morning they will be presenting, and we discuss the conditions. Otherwise, with that, I want to wish you a nice weekend. Mm-hmm.